Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, the research data facility, um, the RDF. Um, I just want to check the text and check that everybody can hear me. Nobody's complaining about everything. It's fine. Good. So I'm going to talk about the research data facility. I just give you an introduction to a bit about what's available as part of the RDF, um, how it's laid out, and how it relates um, to Archer. And possibly what you can use, use it for. So after this um, talk, hopefully you'll have an idea of um, how the RDF could help in your research and the workflow in general, and also um, what the components are and how to get access to them and how to use them. Okay, so uh, just some standard slides about reusing the material, which is Creative Commons, so you can always reuse it if you want, and um, the logos of all the people you're involved in. Um, the Archer service for which we're delivering this uh, webinar. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk first a bit about Archer and the RDF and just try and show um, the differences and similarities between the two of them and how they link together. And then I've got a bit more, um, a few slides on the data analytic cluster, um, which is one of the, as well as the large amount of disk, is one of the major um, hardware components of the RDF um, that we provide to users. And finally, I've just got one slide on the data transfer nodes as well, which are one of the other hardware components that make up the RDF. Okay. So Archer and the RDF, and how do they fit together? So Archer is the um, UK national supercomputer. And um, it's essentially a, a very large power compute resource. Most people who use Archer know a bit about it. It's a crate system. It's got a large number of cores. It's got a high performance interconnect. It's designed really for large parallel calculations. Um, on it, it, there are two file systems. There's home, which, store, which is backed up and um, has slow access, essentially, relatively slow access anyway, and um, it's used for storing critical data, things like source code and um, very key project data, things like that. And then there's also the work file system, which is relatively high performance, especially if you tune it correctly. Um, it stores the input and output from calculations, and it's not long-term storage. It's a parallel file system um, using uh, the Luster uh, technology. So Archer's a big supercomputer designed for doing big calculations with the emphasis um, really on the compute performance of the system and actually doing the calculations more than anything else. So the RDF um, is essentially a large-scale data storage. It's about 20 petabytes uh, usable storage. Um, it's not designed as an archive. Um, it's designed for data that's under active use. Um, the reason for that is if you use the, R the RDF as an archive, it's a very expensive way to provide an archive because all of the data storage in the RDF is essentially spinning disks. Uh, so they're quite expensive to run uh, for archive purposes. If you're going to store these in long term, they're even much more cost effective to use something like tape which although gives slow access, is cheap and lasts a long time. There are multiple file systems um, available on the RDF, and depending on your project, you may have access to different ones. Um, it's got a small data analysis compute resource, so it's got a small cluster directly attached to it. Uh, it's a pretty standard Linux cluster, but it has a very high bandwidth connection to the disks, which means that it can, its um, key use, really, is in processing data that's stored on the RDF. So be that, be that data that's been produced by a calculation Archer, or data that's produced elsewhere that you're preparing maybe for a calculation Archer or some such thing. It also has um, some hardware um, with high performance network access for transferring large amounts of data um, onto the RDF or off the RDF to external um, facilities. And I'll talk about that at the end. So we'll talk about all these bits separately. So just to make sure. Um, I don't get lost, in, or you can always go back and reference and work out what I'm talking about if I slip into jargon when talking about things. There are a number of different bits of both Archer and the RDF. So in Archer, we talk about the login nodes, login. The PP refers to our serial pre- and post-processing nodes, which are part of the Archer system, not the RDF system. We have these MOM nodes, which are the PBS job launcher nodes, which I won't mention much more about in this talk. Um, home, we've already talked about, it's a standard NFS file system. Work. Um, a parallel file system, a Luster parallel file system. On the RDF, we have the terms um, DAC, which is the data an analytic cluster, DTN, which is data transfer node, data transfer nodes, and GPFS, which is general parallel file system. 
that is the technology, the parallel file system technology underlying the RDF storage. So it's not the same um, as the Archer parallel storage, which is um, based on Lustre. It's based on IBM's uh, GPFS technology instead. And it doesn't manifest itself, the RDF doesn't manifest itself as a single file system. There are multiple file systems for different usage. Uh, the one that Archie uses, the ones that Archie uses will come across most often are uh, called slash EPSRC for um, researchers from EPSERC, slash NERC for researchers from uh, NERC, and slash general, which just catches everybody else, uh, all the users are, who aren't members of uh, EPSRC or NERC. They're the sort of Archer RDF file systems. And there are various sort of small RDF file systems, but we're not worried about this those in this presentation, really. So this reasonably horrible looking diagram is supposed to show um, where different nodes are and what file systems are mounted on different nodes. And the reason I tried to draw this up is that it can be a little bit complicated to explain the words, and it's actually reasonably complicated to draw using lines as well, as you can see here, but um, to give people an idea of which things are where. So all the red stuff is part of the Archer service, it's the Archer technology, and all the grey stuff is part of the RDF. Okay, so on Archer we have um, three types of service node and then the compute nodes. So we have the uh, login nodes, the post-processing nodes, the job launch nodes, the mon nodes, and the compute nodes themselves. Okay, and what's mounted? Uh, well, the work file system is mounted everywhere on all nodes. It's the only file system on Archer that's available on every node you can log into or you can get access to on Archer. So it's available to all the compute nodes, it's available to all the job launch nodes, all the both of the PP nodes and all of the login nodes. Okay. The Archer home file system is available on all the sort of service nodes, login, PP and mom, but not on the compute nodes. Um, and this catches people out um, quite a lot uh, when running on Archer, in that you might see that a file is not accessible when you're running on the compute nodes because it's on home, or um, an executable is not access accessible because it's on home. And the reason for this is that home is um, a low perform relatively low performance file system compared to work and low capacity. And if it was mounted on the compute nodes, people would be able to uh, run their applications both very slowly by writing directly to home, and also easily overload the home file system by just writing too much data too quickly because of the um, capability that the computer is on Archer to produce lots of data at once because there's so many of them. Okay, so that's Archer. It's home file system, work file system. On the RDF, we have various general file systems and we have the data transfer nodes and the data analytic cluster. Um, almost all for this purpose, I'm talking about the Archer and RDF interaction, all of the Archer RDF file systems are mounted on both the DTN and the data analytic cluster. But in addition to that, they're mounted on some of the Archer nodes as well. They're mounted on both the login nodes, and so you can see files on there in the login node when you log in interactively, and they're also available on the PP nodes, which explains why the PP nodes really are the main route for uh, the main resource generally for transferring data from Archer file systems, work or home, onto RDF file systems, um, whichever they may be, EPSRC, NERC or general. And you can see here that none of the Archer file systems are mounted on any of the RDF resources. It's only the RDF resources mounted directly into two types of service node on Archer. Okay, so the first thing to know is if you do a small amount of data transfer, just interactive file copying, then you can use the login nodes to move data from Archer to the RDF. But if you're um, transferring large amounts of data, it's better to write a job submission script for the PP nodes and submit it to the serial queue where it will run and it can move data about. Um, I think the other thing I should highlight here um, is that you should never ever um, generally move data from Archer file systems to the RDF file systems, okay? Or even actually move data from between the two Archer file systems. Um, you should always copy the data and then if you want to get rid of the original copy, once you verify this moved over, moved over correctly, you can do that. But if you use the MV command, the move command, uh, to move data, then there's a chance if some sort of network glitch happens or what bit of hardware falls over, that you could lose your data in flight. 
it may be a small chance, but it's a finite chance of you losing your data in flight. So you can always use CP, check that the copied over version is readable and correct before removing the original version of wherever you want to move the data from. Okay. So this is how um, RDF and Archer fit together and how the different file systems um, are mounted across different nodes. What I should have said at the start, of course, as well, is if you have any questions, please um, just stop me asking. You don't need to wait till the end. Please just um, take them in the chat window or use your mic and feel free to ask them. So that's how it all ties together. So I'm going to talk a bit more uh, specific about um, the RDF hardware. I'm not really going to talk about the disks themselves. I'm going to talk about the data analytic cluster and the data transfer nodes. The reason we're not talking about the disks is just because they're not very interesting. Particularly, there's a lot of them. It's a large amount of storage, um, and it's available through standard file systems at the moment. So as I said, at the start, there's about 20 um, gigabytes of usable storage, and that's split amongst the various file systems. But that's not particularly interesting here. Really. So the data analytic cluster, um, which is connected to the RDF storage, um, has a small amount of compute hardware. It has a login node, which has a couple of Ivy Bridge core processors and a large amount of memory. Two standard compute nodes, which have um, two Ivy Bridge 10 core processors and 128 gig of memory. Two high memory compute nodes with more cores and two terabytes of memory, so a lot of memory each. And hyper threading is, available, is enabled on all nodes. So that means that the standard compute nodes each have 40 CPU available because there's two hyper threads um, per physical core, and the high memory nodes each have 64 CPUs available. Okay, but actually the key hardware piece a bit about the RDF, where it's not particularly overwhelming in terms of compute power, but all of the DAC nodes have high bandwidth direct infinity band connections to the UK RDF to the disks, the actual physical disks. This means that the um, I/O rate, the I/O bandwidth. Um, on the DAC nodes should be much higher, say, even than um, the Archer compute nodes to the Archer work disk or from any of the um, Archer nodes to the RDF disk. So if you wanted to do some data analysis on data on the RDF, you could do it on the Archer MT nodes because um, the RDF disks are mounted there, but it would be much more, more efficient to use the data analytic clusters to do it because the connection to the disks is much wider. Okay, um, so typical um, data analytic cluster DAC use cases include things as I've run a calculation on Archer, generated some output onto work as pretty standard Archer calculation. Then I move it to the RDF. It says archive here, but obviously the RDF is not an archive. But you move it to the RDF um, in some sense, and there's information on the RDF website on how to, how to best move data from work to the RDF, how to do it efficiently. And then I want to process um, the data on the RDF disks using the DAC. So I produce some data, and I'm doing some data analysis on the DAC. This is not actually a picture of, a DAC, of the DAC itself. This is a picture of actually of WeArch, which is our Xeon Phi, uh, sorry, Xeon Phi, our Raspberry Pi cluster. The model's how Arch is used, but it was just a handy picture to, of a cluster we had to hand. Um, another use case would be you used another supercomputer somewhere. You transfer the data to the RDF, and then you're processing it on the DAC. Okay, so you want to move the data to a place where you can transfer. So you can actually here probably use the data transfer nodes to move this data across. Um, whereas here, this step of moving data from work to the RDF, you generally do on the Archer PP nodes themselves. Okay. And then you could take that actually and process that and then rerun it on as well. So it could be the input to our calculation on Archer, for example, here. So why would you use the DAC rather than say the PP nodes on Archer or even the compute nodes on Archer? But it's got the fastest connection to the RDF disks. It's much faster than Archer. So if you're doing a lot of input out of disks, so you're transferring file, changing file formats, or taking data, analyzing it, and reading in data, analyzing it, and writing it out to large amounts of data, or you're taking large amounts of data from Archer calculations and trying to move them you know, to somewhere else, then the DAC um, gives you much more capability to do that. Um, you can get 
fast connections to various networks via the DTN nodes. Uh, so we've got the place network, which extends up, which is a 10 gigabit, gigabyte uh, per second network that extends all across Europe. And also we have a fast link down to the NERC Jasmine um, archive uh, down in the south of England. Um, it can be easier and more flexible in the Archer compute nodes to install so, so software. Archer is a quite a um, specialized environment. The compute nodes are designed primarily for um, large parallel jobs. So it can be very difficult to run lots of copies of serial jobs um, or use the Archer compute nodes in a more flexible way. So it's easier and more flexible in the Archer compute nodes maybe for particular types of data analysis. It's also pretty standard Linux, so it's more likely to have standard tools installed in the Archer compute nodes. Um, and they're more powerful than the Archer post-processing nodes as well. Um, and even less oversubscribed at the moment. And they're free to use at the moment, so you're not charged um, for usage um, on the RDF cluster. So you can get a lot, quite, and there's quite a lot of processing power available there for you to use at the moment without being charged. Okay, um, so there are a few reasons for using uh, the DAC. What sort of software does it have on it? Well, we have um, some pretty standard compilers at the moment. We've got, we've got GC, the GCC, the um, GNU compiler comp compiling tools. Um, obviously, got OpenMP, and there's also MPI available from the OpenMPI library. Um, and there's some information here on uh, what modules you load for. One thing I would say about using MPI on the uh, DAC is that you can't use it to span more than one node. So you can use MPI within a node, but you can't use multiple nodes at the moment using MPI. Um, that is just because there's not been a call for it from anyone. Um, we could possibly, we can, if you have a requirement to use uh, more MPI tasks that are available on a single node um, for your analysis. Um, so at the moment, that's 40 for the standard nodes or 64 for the um, high memory nodes, then we can look at installing an MPI library that can span multiple nodes. But at the moment, there's not been any call for it. Um, so we haven't actually installed it at the moment. Um, there's quite a lot of different data analytics software available. So Python is available via the Anaconda distribution, which has a lot of um, data analytic tools built into it. Um, both Python 2 and Python 3. So it has things that support things like uh, Matplotlib, um, Python Notebooks, um, Pandas Statistical Analysis Package. It's got um, linked to um, HDF5 libraries and NetCDF through Python. Or even um, MPI for Pi is available as well um, through the Python environment. And it's pretty pretty standard stuff, and it's very easy to um, add additional packages to the Python environment using either virtual ems, uh, conda virtual ems, or standard ones, um, or we can install packages for you as well if you want them installed centrally um, yourself. And we also have some um, other custom tools installed that support Python, um, and I think there's tools for climate analysis, things like something called Osiris and things like this. So there are various tools involved and in, um, installed that support Python. In addition um, to Python, we have um, the R statistical package is available by default, and we can install extra things for people there. We have various data formats, HDF5 and NetCDF, uh, two common ones. Um, BLAS and LAPAC are available by default, and also um, FFTW. And we also have the support available through the uh, help desk to be able to install and other things. So the exact software you need isn't actually there on the RDF on the DAC at the moment. So we can easily install it for you. Just please get in touch with us um, and let us know what you need, and we'll do our best to make it work for you. Um, as well as this also, uh, that sort of software to web, there's also um, a couple of visualization packages available, or parallel visualization packages, both ParaView and Visit. Um, and they can be used for parallel visualization as well as just standard serial visualization. Paraview works in a client server mode. Um, you use the GUI, GUI as a client and Paraview server versus the PV server and connect the two um, via the via a socket. Um, here's a quick example of how you would do it for um, batch and parallel visualization. So using the batch system, using the DAC for uh, Paraview on a compute node. In this case, we'd be running the GUI on a login node, and then 
connecting via a um, an interactive job to the clients running on the compute nodes. You can also do it um, via remote visualization. So exporting a graphical display can be very slow in the network, so running the GUI on the login node isn't maybe the way to go. So if you have the PowerView client installed locally on your laptop or on your workstation, you can run that GUI locally and connect to the PowerP server running on the DAC using a port forwarding. We've got instructions there, a link to instructions there on how to set this up. Um, there are some compatibility restrictions on PowerView version, so you have to make sure that your client version matches um, the version we've got running on the cluster itself. But apart from that, um, this sort of setup works well. And um, so you can do the same sort of things with Visit as well. And of course, we also support visualization using um, Matplotlib through Python and Python notebooks and, and those sorts of models, those sorts of um, routes as well. Um, on the DAC itself, it has a batch system installed. It's the Talk batch system. It's very similar to PBS, actually. It runs on Archer. So you use QSub, QStack, QDL, just as you would on Archer. It's the only difference is when you're requesting wall time and cores, instead of using the select, minus L select that you'd use on Archer, you use minus L and CPUs to select how many CPUs you want. So you can specify a project using the minus A flag the same way as you would on Archer. Uh, but as I noted earlier, the use is uncharged. It's free points of use. The um, accounting um, flags are just so we can we can work out which projects are using the DAC for um, reporting purposes um, on the RDF. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, also jobs can't use multiple nodes, which means there's a max of 40 cores on the standard nodes or a max of 64 cores on the high memory nodes. Um, and quite often on the DAC, you might want access to the compute nodes in an interactive way. Um, for example, you might want to test something or debug something, or you're doing some visualization, you're doing something interactive, some sort of interactive data analysis. Then you can submit an interactive job. And, and with this sort of syntax here, Q sub minus I is interactive, minus X means export my display back so I can do visualization. You give it the sort of standard options, and you wait for the prompt. And this just gives you a shell on the compute node that you can use as if you were using the shell on the login node. Um, and you can then use that to do your work rather than actually having to submit non-interactive batch jobs all the time. Okay. So finally, in this talk, I just wanted, I just got a slide on the data transfer nodes. The other part of the RDF sort of compute hardware is the data transfer nodes. There are three of these on the system, um, and they're designed to support data transfer to remote sites. Um, from the RDF. So they have high bandwidth um, network connections onto the Janet network and various other networks where appropriate. And they have various software installed um, to do data transfer. So there's the basic, um, what most people use to copy a few small amounts of data backwards and forwards, SCP, SC, SFTP, um, serial transferring of data between sites. And um, that's pretty ubiquitous, almost all. Um, Hosts you'll come across will have this installed, so you can do transfers using this method. Um, you can do parallel transfers using the BBCP uh, tool, which is installed, which essentially runs um, SCPs in parallel, um, but without an encryption overhead to speed up the transfers. And they're also, for people who are doing very large amounts of data transfer, the certificate based methods of Code FTP and Globus Online. Um, these tools allow you to transfer large amounts of data um, in parallel uh, between two systems which have um, Globus Online or uh, the Globus Toolkit installed at both ends. Okay, so many um, big data transfer sites um, will have Globus Online installed, um, and so you can set up your transfers between the RDF and um, this other, the other site using a web interface using the Globus Online website, or you can do it directly using your certificates between the two sites or using Grid FTP. Um, all of these methods are documented on in our documentation, but in particular, if you run into problems um, with the parallel method, which can be more, much more tricky to set up and get right, then you should contact the help desk because we can help you out there. Um, because there's always um, often a lot of wrinkles to sort of in the communication between um, the RDF and 
load sites in terms of firewalls and um, things like that. One thing to bear, that's worth remembering is that in all cases to transfer data, the software must also be installed at the remote end. So just because we've got BBCP at the RDF end, so it isn't enough. The site you're transferring data to must also have BBCP installed for BBCP to work. The same goes for Grid FTP and Globus Online and for FTP and STP. It's just a, it just so happens that they're generally included by default on most systems. Um, but if you're transferring a large amounts of data and you think the parallel methods will be useful to you, then please get in touch with us and we can help you um, get them set up in the best way, in the way that's most useful to you. Okay, so there's three DTN nodes um, that you can use in this way. And more information is available on the DTNs and transferring data um, in the documentation. So in summary, um, at the end of this, the RDF provides complementary functionality to Archer. It's not designed to replace Archer or anything like that. It gives you, it gives a large disk resource, um, which is um, separate from the national facility. So when the national facility finishes, the disks of the RDF are uh, supposed to carry on. There's a data analytic capability, particularly with um, fast I/O access to the data that's on the RDF. Gives you a lot of um, fast file access, um, and um, there's the data transfer capability as well through the DTNs. They give you a variety of tools for moving um, data from re remote sites to the RDF and vice versa. The other thing I should say is that all Archer users and just about should have access to the RDF by default. So you should already, if you've got an Archer account, be able to log into the data analytic cluster or the DTMs and use them. If you can't find out how to do it or you think you don't have an account on the RDF stuff, then please just get in touch with the Archer help desk and they'll be able to help you out with that. Um, so as I said, the data analytics cluster has um, fast IO performance. It has standard tools and codes um, that people might use for data analysis in particular, um, and it gives it has a lot of flexibility on how it can be used and what software we can install. Right? So if there's something you need and you don't know how to get it working, then again, get in touch with us and we can help you out with that. The data transfer nodes have high bandwidth network connections um, off-site, directly into the Janet uh, backbone link of the UK academic network, and a wide variety of data transfer software um, available to try and help people move large amounts of data about. It also actually has some dedicated connections. So I briefly mentioned there's a 10 gigabit link um, onto the PLACE network, which allows you to transfer data across Europe um, very easily. And also we have a, um, a 2 gig link down to uh, the Jasmine data analysis site for climate data, which is down in the south of England. So um, we also have the ability to set up these um, dedicated links between different sites too. Um, so that is the end of my presentation on the RDF and a bit more about um, what, what's available through the RDF. Um, if you have any questions, um, please just let me know either in the chat window or um, by mic if you've got one. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Or if you um, don't have any questions and then think of one later, then please do just drop a line to the help desk. Um, and we can help you out. The other thing I should have mentioned um, was the login addresses um, for the different um, bits of the RDF. Oh, yes, sorry, Chandra, you have a question before I do that? So Chandra asks, is there a, are there file closes on the RDF? Yes, there are. Yeah, so there is, and it's on a per-project basis in the same way as it is on Archer. So if you're a member of, say, um, EO5, which is the Materials Chemistry Consortium, I have no idea if you are or not, they have a certain amount of storage um, space on the RDF that they can allocate out to subgroups. Um, what I would say is that if you don't think you have your project or the project you're a member of does has enough storage on the RDF, then there is always the possibility to increase this. Um, so get in touch with the help desk or get in touch with your PI and ask them if you don't think you have enough storage space. Is there a wall time limit? So I have to admit, I tried, I, that question occurred to me as well when I was writing this talk because I didn't remember set, us setting one up when we first set up the, the data analytics cluster. And I went and had a look, and I think there isn't at the moment. Or if it is, it's set very high. Um, I couldn't find um, 
a limit at the moment, but I will look into that and make sure it's in the documentation because I don't think it's there at the moment. But that is something I need to check out and clarify. But at the moment it's very it's very long. And um, what I should also say is what the uh, login addresses are. So for the uh, DAC, it's um, login .rdf .pc .uk, um, which I'll just put in the chat window. For the DTNs, um, you can use either DTN, oops, DTN01 .rdf .ac .uk, or DTN02 .rdf .ac .uk. There is a DTN3 as well, but it's um, set up for Globus Online access. And if you're an Archer user as well, um, the password for your uh, RDF accounts will be the same as your Archer password. If you don't have any more questions, then I'll probably um, end the session here. Do you have anything else you want to ask, Chandra? OK, well, thank you for coming along. Um, as I said, this uh, session's been recording, so, so we'll put it up on the um, Archer website for people to see there as well. Um, and we'll also put the slides up. I'll try and add to them with the uh, I'll add to them the login addresses which I missed off, and also try and find out about the wall clock limits for um, the DAC to put into the slides before we put them up as well. Um, but thank you very much for coming along, and thank you for your questions.